Okay, so uh, it is just after five, so we'll kind of get started. If you haven't already, you can grab a glass of wine, just sit back and relax, uh, learn a little bit about unique Aussie wildlife today. So on that note, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. This is our ongoing Travel Tuesdays webinar series. Um, so tonight we're just going to present a little bit about Australia and the unique um, wildlife that you can find there. Uh, your host today, and we are all Australian tonight. I know you can't hear it in my voice, but or my accent. But I did live in Australia for over ten years. I am an Australian citizen as of 2016. Um, and then I'm also my name's Audra, and I'm with Down Under Endeavors. Um, also with me tonight is Vanessa Massey. She's my uh, coworker and fellow de travel designer. Uh, she is based in Chicago, um, but originally from Sydney. Uh, we also are lucky to have at least one presenter. I think we might be having some time issues with our second presenter. Um, but all the way from down under, we have Stab Lord. Um, he is the owner of Lord's Kakadu and Arnhem, Arnhem Land Safaris in the Northern Territory. And if we can get her in the next 20 minutes, we're going to have Gemma Hayworth. She's with the Mariah Island in Tasmania. Um, so good day to, for joining all of us today. And just to kind of, I think we just uh, jumped over that slide, but just um, for some of you guys, just a little bit about us, because I do see some new names in here, which is pretty exciting. Um, just a little background about us. Uh, we are Australian owned for 22 years in the business this year. Um, we specialize in the South Pacific and really are the experts. Um, our main goal is to make sure that all of our trips are tailored and customized to each one of our travelers. No two trips are the same. It's all based on your interests. For you guys, predominantly wildlife, um, but things also like um, wine, culture, and then also we'll, um, we'll fine tune your itinerary based on your accommodation, your travel dates, and your, um, your budget. Our big, we're big advocates for local um, touring, so um, make sure that you have the most authentic experiences um, when you travel. For our agenda tonight, um, we are kind of going all over Australia, which is pretty exciting. Um, I'm going to kind of kick it off with the Great Barrier Reef and some marine life um, experiences that you can have there, but as well as talk a little bit about Hamilton Island and some wildlife there. Um, then Sab's going to talk a little bit about the Northern Territory and Kakadu, um, some of the national park wildlife and culture experiences you can have there. Uh, Gemma will talk about Mariah Island Walk, the four-day walk um, that you can have in Tasmania. She also has some awesome videos for you guys. And then um, Vanessa will finish off with an update on Kangaroo Island and some of her experiences there. Um, just to kind of go through kind of the question and answer, uh, if you do have questions, please place them in the chat box on the right side of your screen. Uh, we'll make sure to answer them at the end. Um, also, we'll be recording this. So if you guys want to watch this later or send it to friends, we'll get this off to you in the next few days as well. Uh, so let's get into it. Ah, the Great Barrier Reef. So, um, as many of you know, it's a World Heritage Site and one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, in terms of size, it's almost the size of Italy. Uh, it's about 2,300 kilometers or just over 1,400 miles long uh, and located on the northeastern coast of Australia, just outside of the state of Queensland. Um, it contains the world's largest uh, collection of coral, 1,400 types of hot, hard and soft coral, 1,600 species of fish, and 3,000 3, types of mollusks. Uh, due to its size, uh, there are a number of places you can see the Great Barrier Reef, but my personal favorite is from the Whitsunday Island, um, specifically on Hamilton Island. Um, looking at this map, Hamilton Island is pretty much in the center. If you can kind of get your eyes on Long Island, it's just right of there. Um, Hamilton Island is part of this uh, island chain called the Whitsundays. It only has a few inhabited islands, um, so lots of stunning beauty with kind of nothing going on in nearby islands. Um, also very easy to get to. Despite being an island, there is a commercial airport, um, so you have access there from direct flights from Sydney, Melbourne, um, Cairns, Brisbane, and also a ferry from Shoot Harbor if you're doing a self-drive trip up the East Coast. So this is a photo of Hamilton Island um, from the marina side. Um, as you can kind of tell in the distance, uh, lots of natural um, vegetation, so lots of room for hiking. Two thirds of the island is um, 
is, is untouched. So um, again, loads of hikes, a lot of opportunities for wildlife on those hikes. For me, I got to see two wallabies kind of having a fight, very traditional Aussie, uh, going up for a walk to Passage Peak. And then you can also do some great walks to some local private beaches. Uh, in terms of accommodation, this is my favorite accommodation on the island. It's Qualia, it's the five-star property. Um, lots of pool options, lots of views. And I think one of the coolest things, um, if you're there during the winter months, you get a great option to see some whales just breaching right off, right from your pool. Uh, okay, so the reef. Um, there are a couple of ways to get there. Um, it is about 150 miles offshore. So you can either take a boat or my favorite is going by helicopter. Um, the cool thing about the helicopter is that you do fly over some awesome, awesome scenery. Um, in the right-hand photo, um, that is the Heart Reef, so which is pretty iconic to this part of Australia. Um, it basically is a coral, um, coral that's shaped perfectly like a heart. There are a lot of other opportunities. So I think, sorry, maybe a bit of technical difficulty on those, but yeah, there we go. Um, so with that, there is also, like I said, an option to go by boat. Um, this is about two hours from Hamilton Island. Um, what's so great about this is that um, there can be a pontoon set up. So it really does allow for a good um, long day at the reef. Um, so whether you're a confident swimmer and you want to do, or a diver, you can have options to certify, do a certified dive, an introductory dive, or snorkel. Um, so a lot of that's really cool. Um, just kind of probably the main thing to note if you're diving, you just have to be over the age of 12. And then there's a little pretty strict um, conditions in terms of a medical questionnaire to dive, but we can kind of chat through all of that before you, before you go. So things that you're going to see on the reef, um, kind of unique to the Whit Sundays, um, and some of my favorite things to kind of over, do over there is the unique fish that you're going to find there are basically you're finding Nemo, your clownfish, your surgeon fish, um, but also unique fish. Um, one that I don't have pictured here, but it's the Maori wrasse fish. Um, they're huge, so they're pretty iconic to the Whit Sundays. It's kind of the, the fish that you want to get the photo with. Um, in terms of a selfie, there's a fish out there called George, there's one that's called Elvis, so really cool to this part of, part of the reef. Um, also really cool around the, the uh, with Sunday's part is a parrot fish. Um, and that's pretty cool because when you're snorkeling and you're kind of under underwater, you can kind of hear it crunching on the coral. So yeah, kind of unique to, to this part, part of the reef. Um, in terms of best time to visit, um, so obviously I've, there's a lot of different wildlife. You have the whales, the turtles, fish, and koalas. So really it is any time of year. Um, dry season, so kind of think even here in the US, if you're gonna kind of flip the, flip the country around, the dry season there is April through November. Um, pretty good time to go any of, that, in any of that period because June through September, you're gonna get to see some great um, opportunities for whales really right around Hamilton Island or all the way up through to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, November is really great for turtle hatching and so you'll see the little hatchling through March and like you can see with the koala there there is a wildlife park located on Hamilton Island so always koalas year-round. Uh, like I said so just to give you um, with the Great Barrier Reef being about 150 miles out you do have that option but you also do have some really cool options closer to Hamilton Island and closer to the island. Uh, one here is the turtles. So they do do a turtle discovery tour. So it's a beautiful fringing reef, very close to Hamilton Island, as you can see. Great for kids, great for people who aren't super confident in deep waters, but a really great wildlife experience there too. And then just another wonder that's another kind of big piece to go to Hamilton Island is you have the famous White Haven Beach. Uh, it is one of the top five beaches in the world. It has that awesome white silica sand, and it's only 30 minutes by boat. Um, and even quicker if you want to do a seaplane. So great for couples, awesome for kids, a um, lot of snorkeling opportunities there too. So a lot of fish too if you're not going out to the reef or just want to kind of have a secondary trip that's also not the reef. Something else for wildlife. And lastly, um, so like I said, we, they do have the Hamilton Island um, Wildlife Park there. Um, you can do the breakfast with the koalas, which you can see in the left-hand picture. 
Um, that's pretty unique. They bring, they kind of bring them out on the trees and you can kind of have a nice breakfast with them. Um, and afterwards you can tour the wildlife park for kangaroos. And this is where I also got to see um, a baby koala, which was really cool. Um, and then you also have dingoes and um, crocodiles and everything there as well. And then iconically at Hamilton Island or Australia and, the, and that Queensland area is that cockatoo um, bird. Uh, look at it right in the middle there. Um, they're always going to be found pretty much on any accommodation that you're uh, around that area. Just make sure you close your doors because they will come inside to your neighbor. Um, and that's kind of it. So I will pass you on to Scrub to talk a little bit more about the Northern Territory. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, not too good at all this sort of stuff. So I do apologize if something happens, okay? But um, I'm the owner of Lords Kakadu and Arnhem Land Safaris. Uh, the business has been going for 28 years now. And uh, my father actually started it and then I took over about 22 years ago. And basically over time changed the direction of the company because of what I experienced in Africa. Um, I've been traveling to Africa since 1984 and probably been there about 25 times. And I could see that um, we were lacking that sort of safari experience in, in Northern Australia. So I established the business, changed the name, and then started uh, slowly because it would take a long time of doing private charters. Um, I was the first person or company to start doing the private aspect of just taking one to maximum six people in, in a vehicle and giving the people the experience. So for me, it's, uh, I still enjoy doing it. Um, for me, it's, uh, it's to try and educate people on how important our wildlife is, but also the environment is, is crucial. Considering that my dad was a crocodile and buffalo shooter back in the 50s, 60s and 70s, and he actually opened up about 35% of Kakadu. So I've been awfully fortunate that I grew up with Aboriginal people. And in fact, I do call them blacks. Um, that's all right, okay? So don't get offensive if some of you say you can't, but that's, that's how uh, my relation. Uh, I have been through ceremony um, as well. So my relationship with Aboriginal people go back a long way. And um, they're an amazing race of people, very good at what they do. Um, and I employ them on probably 99% of my um, tours, but can also um, get the people to uh, go out bush and, and experience as well. Um, just go to the next one, love you. So we use the vehicle at the below there is the GXL vehicles, um, custom made trailers. And basically there's only three of us. So there's myself, um, Dean Hates and I have um, employed a girl, um, Bianca, and she's coming aboard, a very nice um, lass, and this year we're going to run three trucks, but she's coming back to work for me next year, and looking forward to it. But we do walks with Aboriginal people um, in different areas. Angelac Hill, which is probably renowned as some of the best rock art um, in Northern Australia, probably around Australia, and you're able to go with an Aboriginal. We actually don't go with the Aboriginal because he gets a bit confronted if I'm there because he won't talk so much about the art. So we go to another place and meet you for a beautiful um, picnic overlooking the, the valleys below. Um, so you have the opportunity to, to go there. You see the artist painting, uh, the women weaving, and then you have the opportunity of being able to buy. We explain the whole technique, how it's all done, the dyes they use, so forth like that. And then you have the opportunity to actually buy from the art centre. And it's a non-profit organisation and the money goes back into the art centre and the artists themselves. So it's um, it works really well. Um, I've been going there with my dad when we first opened. So it's been a long time with my relationship with the, with the Aboriginal people there. Next one, mate. Um, so these are some of the views. Um, my emphasis is not just on one particular subject. My emphasis in, in the company is the experience from bird watching um, right through to the Aboriginal culture, um, 
photographing. I get quite a few photographing um, people now that come to want to do. So the pictures on the right hand side there is an exclusive area in Arnhem Land um, to, to ourselves. No one else is allowed to go there except for the clan group. Well, you might know them as tribes, but we don't call them tribes, they're clans. So that's the Nyingle clan group and that's their country. So I grew up with all that family. So that gives me access in there. So from about June onwards, we can get in there. Before that, we can't because of the, the amount of water. But um, photography-wise, the amount of birds that we have, um, well over 280 species of birds, but also the crocodiles. We have two species of crocodiles, um, one freshwater, one um, saltwater crocodile. So it, it's a paradise for photographers with the landscape, as you can see the Arnhem Land Escarpment there on the right-hand side, which is anywhere between 1.5 to 2.4 million years old. Next one, mate. Um, so this is Yellow Waters. Um, we do use Yellow Waters, which is actually owned by the indigenous people of Kakadu National Park. Um, it can be private if you'd like a private one, or this is one of the few where I'm not with you or Dean or Bianca. Um, but you can have private, there's no problem. There is a boat there that they will let me use um, and it takes a maximum of eight people. But it is great experience. We always uh, do it at sunset, unless someone specifically wants it for the morning. It's a bit more commercial that, than I like. It's probably the only commercial thing that we, you will actually do on our, our, um, our charters. Next one, mate. Um, so on the left, of course, crocodiles. Everyone wants to see a crocodile and there's lots of big crocodiles now. Um, and the crocodile population is probably at its peak now in the Northern Territory. They were protected in 1971 and my dad was one of the people that got them protected because he could see what was happening um, in the ecosystem. And at that stage, there were less than 5,000 saltwater crocodile, crocodilus porosus left. And now there's probably 100,000 plus, but big crocodiles now. N not uncommon to see crocodiles um, five, six metres now, um, more and more each year. On the right is um, airboats, and the airboats are used to family planes. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about that. So the the airboats at Bamaroo Plains um, is owned by a gentleman from uh, Charles Carlo from Sydney and it's on a private station. So Dean and myself um, are the only outside um, guides that aren't employed at Bamaroo that are able to do all the private guiding there. So we just take you out on the airboats or um, the sunset trips and that. And it's just us and my, and my clients. And it really worked well because if people come to the Northern Territory and they want just the one guide for the whole trip, doesn't matter if it's three days to whatever period of time, um, they'll get either me or Dean and then we'll be Bianca next year. So you get the same experience. You get probably, don't leave a lot patting yourself on the back, but you know some of the best guides that... Um, that's in the territory, and I mean, I've been doing it for a long time. Dean's been around for 20 years, been with me for about eight years now, um, but he's been guiding for, for around 20 years as well. Um, so it, it's an amazing experience at Bamaroo. It's like stepping in the Okavanga. So it was designed on an African experience a little bit, but it's an Australian experience, but the accommodation and the food and that is top notch. So you get a great opportunity to um, see what the top end is all about. And many times I've had people that cry. Okay, mate, next one. Um, so we go to waterfalls um, in, our, in our endeavor. The best experience in Kakadu, and I know it's very, very quiet, so all of you, I'd like you to write it down, is Coolpin Gorge. It's not really advertised that much. You need a permit to get there. There's only three of us that have permits to go there. Um, not allowed to go on weekends or public holidays because that's for the the local people. Maximum 40, but last year, the ones I did there, we never saw anyone else. It's a bit of a walk, so you can't not be able to walk, but um, the photography in that there is just amazing and beautiful swimming. 
These couple that you see here, the top ones is McGook or Gunlom Falls. It can get a bit um, crowded up there. So um, I just warn people about that. That's why I try and push uh, Coolpin if you're active. Um, but we go to a number of waterfalls because in Arnhem Land, uh, there's only one place which um, you're able to have a swim, and that's at Davison, but that runs out about August. Um, so it depends what people want. You can have good walking trips um, to more remote areas, or if not been able to, you know, we can access areas that are accessible to people that haven't got the ability to walk too much. Next one, mate. Um, so I do have different um, trips on my website. They're all suggested itineraries um, from three days to, I'll do three weeks, um, which the longest one I've ever done is 23 days, uh, a French couple. And they did the top end and then the Kimberley region with me. Um, so we do do the Kimberleys as well, um, but you've got to be quite active to do the Kimberleys because there's more walking involved there. A bit more driving as well because of the huge distances you're doing. Um, I will not go to the Kimberleys, so write this, I will not go to the Kimberleys in July. Uh, school holidays here and too many people um, with it. But again, um, the three day can be either a, um, accommodated or camp. There is a shared one next year, but it's filling up really quick with charters. So I don't know how many dates I'll have left um, the way it's going at the moment. So what I will do is, as, as the season goes on, I will delete the ones that have already gone because it's, um, I haven't sold one shared one then. They've all been sold as private charters so um, that people want. And next one, mate. Um, so Bamaroo um, has a beautiful look. So down on the right-hand side, that's the bedrooms looking out on the floodplains. And it's on a fully operational Buffalo station. So the person that owns it, I've known since I was seven years old. Um, and it's a Buffalo cattle station. It has about 8,000 Buffalo on it. Lots of wallabies, wild dingoes, wild horses. There's also Bang Pang cattle there, um, which is a wild Indonesian um, cow. It's the only, in Australia, it's the only place that's actually running wild anymore. So uh, people that are into photography, because it's a beautiful animal. It's not much good to eat. The meat's terrible. Um, so that's why it's not used for human consumption. And, but uh, it's a beautiful animal because of the, uh, the stripings on its, on its feet and its head and everything. The airboat again on the left is we're going through a Melaleuca swamp. And that is just blows people away. Even for me, I'd still just love it in there. Lots of crocodiles in there. Well, they actually had one try and get into the boat there, so you've got to be a little bit careful, keep away from them a bit. And up in the right-hand corner is a Leichhardt grasshopper. It's the rarest grasshopper in the world. It's not that smart. Um, it lives on a, a species called Pterodia, and when it eats that, uh, it starves to death. Um, but it's really important in Aboriginal um, culture of what it represents. So some years we see them. Now the most places you'll see them is the Davison's Arnhem Land Safari Camp. Um, and then other years you won't find them at all. So it depends on when they um, hatch because they uh, lay their eggs in the sand. Um, the other ones are just yellow waters and a good photo of a crocodile I took you know, quite a few years ago. And that bear is about 95 centimetres in his mouth. All right, mate. <coughs> Um, yep. So here's our bird life. These are all my photos. Um, I love photography. So if I do get uh, people that come with their big lenses and so forth, I take all my gear as well because we just get on so well. Um, so the front is a white-bellied sea eagle. It was called a white-breasted sea eagle, but uh, people got upset about that. So they changed the name to it. And that's a blue-winged kookaburra up on the top. Uh, only found in the tropics. There's 12 species of kingfishers. It belongs to the kingfisher family in Australia, but it can't laugh. And it sounds like it's had too many red wines the night before, okay? Because it just can't laugh. But beautiful bird. I've got them around my camp. I have a whole family. And over the years, they'll be miss missing me this year. 
I've worked out who the dominant male is and the juvenile male. So it's quite amazing to see the hierarchy in, in, the, in that particular family. The magpie goose is the one that's landing. Um, there's about 3.5 million of them in the tropics. It's one of the most favoured food by the Aboriginal people when they get fat, and they know when they get fat because um, at the time, and it dictates their uh, cycle within Aboriginal um, calendar, because they have six uh, calendars where we are, and they wait until they get the what we call water chestnuts, which most of you would have eaten in some form or another in Chinese food. Um, they dig down and get it. Uh, that's a jacana or a Jesus Christ bird on the left. You can see the size of his feet. Um, so he looks like he's walking across the water. And the females is a lot bigger than the, than the male. And it's one of the same as the emu. The male actually brings up the young. They have four. And then you've got uh, plume whistle ducks, which are the bottom ones. Um, um, this is a jab, jabberoo or, or stork, which is, of course, named after South American thing. Um, the female has yellow around its eyes and the male is, as this one is here. Again, we're awfully fortunate that at Davison's, I have a great working relationship and, and with Max when he was alive. And we were the only company again allowed to do all our guiding. We have our own vehicle there, boats. So we, because it's bigger than Bamaroo, there's 20 lodges there, rooms. Um, we find out where all the others are going and we go the opposite way. We never, ever go where the groups are going. So we just keep everything. And then um, one night there, or you can go for minimum is uh, two nights stay, but we do do three or four because there's enough to do. Um, but we do have sunsets out in the Billabong, which is just incredible um, during the thing. I mean, some of the best sunsets that you will ever get is actually at Davison's with the with the escarpment in the background and the overlooking of the um, the floodplains. Can do fishing there as well. Um, July is not a good time, but um, before that is not bad. Um, and then towards the end of the year, but we put them all back. Um, we don't keep any. And the fish used to once upon a time, but now because of um, important to keep the population up. This is some of the escarpment in Arnhem Land. Again, that's the vehicles that I use. I've actually got a brand new one sitting in a shed in Darwin that's done 3,000 kilometres. And that's where it'll sit until next year. Um, but that's some of the escarpment that we will walk in. Um, so it gives you an idea of um, the sort of terrain that we do walk over. And as I said before, it's not about how fit you are, it's your ability. Because I have taken people who are uh, uh, in their 70s but fit as Mally Bulls. But then I've taken people who are in their 30s and they've just had one too many beers, um, unable to walk. So it's up to the ability of the people that can do it, um, which is important. But um, with it, it gives us the opportunity at Lord Safaris, go to the next one, love. Um, at Lord Safaris is that we have access into areas that no one else is able to. This is not a really good picture. I was getting new ones this year, but this is my camp, but you can't see those tents anymore. They've all been rebuilt two years ago, all new covers, um, and I planted about 100 trees in there. And we have um, a big eating house. Everything's cooked on the fire still. And I do have a camp host these days. So I started two years ago. So G makes the beds, puts the towels, make sure everything's nice and tidy and helps setting up the, um, the d dinner situation and so forth like that. And I love my camp um, because it was built by the family. And um, there's a lot of wildlife around there. I do have cat traps to catch any feral cats because that's the big issue in Australia is feral cats more than anything else. And um, we're able to sleep 14 there. They all have solar. And as I said, it doesn't look like this anymore. You wouldn't even recognise if you had the photos now. Um, but they have solar in there. They have fans, which you don't need fans um, June, July, August, because it does get quite cold. Like there last year, it got down to seven, but it's a cold seven. It's not like 
where I am at the moment in New Zealand, you get to seven and you go, oh God, it's hot. So, um, and we've got a couple other things that are coming, like I just bought a, a big solar fridge and so forth like that. So each year I put a bit more money into the camp. Um, but it's a real good experience um, for families that have never been out in the bush because you're not in a swag, you're actually in a tent. Nothing can get into them, no spiders or because that's what the big worry is all the time, um, a big huntsman spiders. But they cannot get in there and we keep an eye on all that kind of stuff. We don't use any sprays around the camp um, at all to kill the bugs. Some people do, but I won't allow that at my camp um, because as soon as you start using those pesticides, it kills all your spiders and your little, little quitters that are running around. But plenty of wildlife, so it's good. Next one, I love. Um, so again, this is uh, Bamaroo um, with their accommodation. You see the pool. Well, I can tell you don't hop in that pool in July because um, two sex might go in, but only one comes out. It's that cold. Um, the airboats again down the bottom, and it just shows you um, an experience. Now, there's only really two two operators in the Northern Territory that use airboats. And um, it is a unique way, and it's the only way you can experience the floodplains um, at Bamaroo. And we're awfully fortunate that the station owner lets us go all over the um, the floodplains, which are massive. I mean, they are just when people get there, they just can't believe how big they are. So it, it is a unique experience to um, experience that. Um, some. Bamaroo is really, you know, they go, it's about luxury and so forth. It is, but for me, it's about what's outside. Same at Davison's or anywhere I go, it's about what's out around you. And that's why we uh, actually, I'm a founding member of the Australian Wildlife Journey Group because I could see what was happening in Africa and we were competing against the big, big five in Africa. But we've got the same in Australia up right around Australia that we have a unique wildlife that nowhere else is found in the world. So it took a few years to get it, but with the help of John Dorr and, and Craig Wickham, which was amazing, we got it up and going. And um, I'm just pleased because people have got involved and are really um, helping to establish that Australia is not, not just about beaches and, and the, you know, going out but there's also inside Australia there's the experience of the wildlife and you know just an experience because we don't have the population and I think that Australia in the next 20 or so years will become one of the major tourist attractions because of its safety but of the vastness. Um, next one mate. Um, this is this is uh, Davison's so give you a, it's more rusky sort of experience um, I always put everyone in the, they saved a couple of rooms for me in the luxury, the, what they call the executive sort of suites, there's a couple of them. Um, that's the one on the bottom there. Um, and the lounge rooms at the top, we have our own table there as well. So we don't sit with the other group. Um, we sit by ourselves unless, you know, they meet someone that they want to sit with. Um, there's a pool there. Again, you don't hop in there in July because it's absolutely freezing. Um, and then there's a bar down there. Most important thing to everyone that's listening to this, they charge for their alcohol and soft drinks there. <laughs> that is all included in the quote that I will give. They do not have to put their hands in the pocket, okay? Um, that's a really important thing because sometimes people will turn up there, and I've seen it when I've been there, and the agent they send them there and then all of a sudden they're, because they charge quite expensive for their wines, like $35, I think is the cheapest bottle. And you can see that they're a little bit, bit grumpy because the agent hasn't told them that they've got to pay for their soft drinks and their wines and their beers. Okay. So I make sure that's all included um, when, when we get there. Right. Eh? So it's a, it's a really unique place that has amazing, amazing, um, Aboriginal art and the traditional owner is actually still alive. He's about 85, old Charlie. Um, he was taken away early um, before the Second World War um, as a kid 
<clears throat> but he does live there now during during the tourist season. Um, he has his own cabin and so forth. So, yeah. Next one, mate. <coughs> this is Coinda. Now, Coinda is next to my camp. It's only 10 minutes from my camp. And sometimes, it's very seldom, I only had three groups last year, uh, don't want to camp, um, which is understand. They were all Americans, actually. Um, but they wish now that they'd had camp when they saw my camp. Um, but this is the the Coinda itself. So you can just basically put these in to show you what the rooms and that look like. Um, we include everything in the, in at Coinda except for alcohol because they charge like a wounded bull. Um, but we include the meals um, and so forth like that um, into it. So it's uh, it's just a bit of a opportunity if people don't want to stay at, at my camp. So just to wrap it up, um, I thank you for everyone. I mean, I'm not too good at this sort of stuff. So I've probably forgotten some information I should have passed on. But um, we, we can do anything that your clients want. I've done helicopter uh, safaris across the top end and in the Kimberleys, um, where people just go in helicopters. But uh, I can put anything together. So at any time you want any other information, my web, website is reasonably up to date but it's always good and like i said if you need any other information about areas that i haven't been talking about so there's places that go like uh, bremer island which is a really nice place owned by a part aboriginal um, people it's a great experience as well um, so it just really depends on what people are looking for Anyway, I'd like to thank everyone for listening uh, and I hope you a little bit got a little bit out of it. Thanks, team. Thanks so much, Sav. Um, and I do think Gemma's here, so I'll pass it on to Gemma to talk a little bit about the Mariah Island Walk. Thank you. Um, not sure what's going on with my video, but that's okay. We've got the slides. Um, so, <laughs> hi, everyone. My name is Gemma and I'm from the Mariah Island Walk. So, the Mariah Island Walk is a gentle four-day guided walk on Mariah Island which is a World Heritage listed national park off the east coast of Tasmania. So we take small groups of just 10 guests and two guides to experience rare wildlife, beautiful scenery, excellent food and wine, and fascinating history. <coughs> so next slide, please. So every day we walk along beautiful beaches through tall forests and see stunning scenery everywhere we go. The walking is quite gentle and it's done on flat, well-formed trails and hard sand beaches. So it's suitable for anyone with a moderate level of fitness. For people wanting a bit more of a workout, we also have the opportunity to climb one of the two mountain peaks on the island. And next slide, please. So each night we stay in exclusive accommodation that's only used by guests of the Mariah Island Walk. For the first two nights, we stay in private wilderness camps next to the beach, where you wake up to the sounds of waves and bird calls in the bush, which is really beautiful. The camps are eco-friendly and they have clean composting toilets and bush showers. On the third night, we stay at Banaki House, which is a beautifully restored heritage home in the convict settlement of Darlington. So guests have a few more creature comforts on their last night on the island. Next slide, please. Yep. So one of our most highly complimented aspects of the walk is the food and wine. So most of our guests can't believe they're eating such incredible restaurant quality food on a remote island. Each night we enjoy three course gourmet meals by candlelight, which are matched to fine Tasmanian wines and local beers. So the walk is completely all inclusive. So you can have as much as you want, but you do need to be able to walk the next day. So as well as dinner, we have breakfast, morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea, and often a cheese board before dinner too. So nobody ever goes hungry. <laughs> Next one, yep. So the reason most people come to Mariah Island and the reason we're all here today is the wildlife. So Mariah Island is known as the Noah's Ark of Tasmania, and it's one of the best places 
if not the best place to see wombats in the wild. So this video was taken by one of our guides this season of a mum and a baby <coughs> wombat. And it's the kind of experience that our guests get to have every single day, which is really special. <laughs> I think that's the video, yep. <laughs> um, so as well as wombats, there is an abundance of other wildlife on the island. That includes kangaroos, wallabies, paddy melons, Tasmanian devils, Cape Barren geese, and all 12 of Tasmania's endemic bird life species. So Tasmanian devils are quite rare to see in the wild, but our guests are lucky enough to see them sort of every few trips on the island. One. So this video was taken by Georgia, one of our guides, on a walk this season. The devils can tend to be pretty cheeky and we often find them sniffing around our camps looking for something to eat. We have to be careful about what we leave out, um, as you will see in this video in a moment. Yeah. So yeah, they're pretty cheeky. You can't leave your things out because the devils will steal them and will eat them. Um, but that is pretty much everything from me. Thank you for your time. And we hope that we'll meet some of you on a walk soon. I'll pass over to Vanessa. Thanks, Gemma. Um, so good day, everyone. I'm Ness and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about Mike's experiences on Kangaroo Island. Uh, so Kangaroo Island sits off the coast of South Australia and is Australia's third largest island. So it covers an area of about 4,400 square kilometres. Um, so think of an area about six times the size of Singapore. To get to Kangaroo Island, it's a 45 minute flight from Adelaide or you can take the ferry. We typically recommend about two to three nights on the island. And there's a range of accommodation options from hotels, hosted b, &B stays, to self-contained villas and houses. There is something for everyone and we can definitely tailor um, where the accommodation style to our clients' needs. So Kangaroo Island is a great place to reconnect, to reconnect with nature, each other, slow down and rediscover the things that really matter in life. The beaches are amazing. The walks and hikes are spectacular. The fishing is world-renowned and there's a variety of experiences that you can have here. You can be as busy as you like, but you can also sit back, relax and just take it all in. Best known as the Galapagos of Australia, wildlife count encounters here are pretty much a given. Kangaroos, sea lions, koalas, echidnas, wallabies, goannas and marine mammals are plentiful along with many species of bird life. So if you're after wildlife, Kangaroo Island never disappoints. And the best way to have some of these amazing wildlife encounters is to definitely tour with somebody who knows exactly where to find them. So we have the right ac access to the right people for the job. So here you can see the exceptional Kangaroo Island team, which is headed by Craig and his wife, who have been guiding on the island for 30 plus years. So whether you're looking for small group touring, private touring, we can tailor a range of different options to suit your needs. Some of the highlights are gonna include a walk down a country track through tall eucalyptus trees where koalas snooze overhead or wake briefly for a feed. At Seal Bay Conservation Park, you can take a private tour among Australian sea lions on a beautiful sandy beach. Here you can watch the pups nursing or playing in the surf. You can see the old bulls bearing scars of territorial disputes, and you can learn about their unique breeding biology. 
You can explore the massive natural shapes of the remarkable rocks. You can seek out kangaroos, which are on the smaller side than the eastern greys, which you'll find on the mainland. Or you can head to Pentington Bay, which is the narrowest part of the island. And that gives you access to Southern Ocean Beach, which is a popular fishing and surfing spot. There are also plenty of food experiences to have on the island, such as the farming region of Signet River. This region produces primary food sources, including barley, wheat, oats, lamb, and beef. So here you can learn about the agricultural history of Kangaroo Island. You can check out Kangaroo Island Olives, which is a father and son duo, and they produce olive from, olives from a grove of 5,000 trees. You can stop at Clifford's Honey Farm and they specialize in producing honey from Kangaroo Island's native bees. For those wine lovers among us, there are a few wineries on the island which produce a premium range of red, reds and whites. So you can definitely stop in and have some wine tastings. And for those of us that like the harder stuff, you can visit Kangaroo Island Spirits. Um, they've won numerous awards globally, including New York and London, for their range of beautiful gins and liqueurs. So Kangaroo Island, like most of Australia, is regularly impacted by bushfires during the summer. While most of the fires are much more localized, the summer of 2019-2020 saw some unprecedented bushfire events that impacted the island as well as other parts of Australia. The island is now in recovery. Businesses are beginning to be supported through tourism returning and nature is recovering at a lightning speed. Visitors to the island over the coming months and onwards will be treated to the unique opportunity of seeing the harsh blackness already softened by rains and new signs of growth and life. Wildlife is venturing back to recovery grounds to look for food sources and homes, and they are unhidden by the bush that once was an obstacle that they could hide behind. Here you can see pictures of what the regrowth currently looks like. Um, so that you can see that the island is already starting to recover and over time this will grow back into what it was prior to those bushfires. Um, so as you can see, each region is beautiful and offer a wide range of unique wildlife experiences. If you'd like to know more, please reach out to us at Down Under Endeavours and we'd be happy to work with you to customise your perfect holiday. Our next Travel Tuesday is going to be on August 25th. Um, and we're going to be recovering remote wilderness experiences in New Zealand. So we'll be sending out another e-blast closer to the date if anybody's interested in joining us for that one. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us this evening and a special thanks to Saab and Gemma for joining us all the way from Australia. Um, and if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat box and we can answer them now. Um, otherwise, have a great evening guys and thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Vanessa. No worries, Sam. Thanks, guys. Okay, team. Anything you need, just call me, okay? Thanks, Sam. Um...